So good afternoon. Thank you all for attending. My name is Andrew Murtha, and I'm the George and Sadie Hyman Professor of China Studies here at Johns Hopkins SAIS. This is the first lecture in a second part uh, of the SAIS China Global Research Center's ongoing series on methodologies studying China. The first part is focused on Pekingology for a new era. The second one, this one, studying China from the outside is in response to the anxiety that many of us face, particularly those starting out their careers by the recent curtailing of access to China, access that we had taken for granted for so long. We can try to mitigate these challenges in many ways. And one of them is to study China from elsewhere. So each of the speakers in this series, today's speaker, Professor Mike Lampton, as well as subsequent speakers this semester, Maria Repnikova, Maggie Lewis, Bill Hurst, and myself, We've all done this from vantage points ranging from just across the Taiwan Straits to mainland Southeast Asia, to Indonesia, to Africa, sometimes through a cross-national comparison, sometimes by looking at the effects of China's outward direct investment on recipient countries, and sometimes by going back in time. My hope is that this series will provide some inspiration as well as an initial toolkit to help us be creative and entrepreneurial in our study of China during this difficult time. I want to thank everybody who's made today's event possible, particularly Eli Rostom, Amanda Nepomucino, Pasta Coleman, Pedro Matias, Jessica Moreno, and Mo Elahi. Now let me introduce today's speaker, Professor David Mike Lampton. Mike's CV is attached to the flyer of this program, so I'd like to take the liberty of giving a more personal introduction. The universe of my approach to Chinese politics emerged from the pioneering scholarship of Doak Barnett and his two students, Kenneth Lieberthal and Mike Oxenberg, both of whom I had the good fortune of having on my dissertation committee and to whom I will be forever indebted for their mentorship. But there's another equally vital part of that triumvirate, Professor Mike Lampton. Mike was not on my dissertation committee, but he might as well have been. Mike's work has had an undue influence on my own, particularly in the area of policy implementation in China. And of course, since his early work on policy implementation, following his tenure as professor at Ohio State University, and then as president of the National Committee on US-China Relations, and most recently for the two decades leading up to 2018 as director of China Studies at Johns Hopkins SAIS. He has become universally respected as the Ur scholar of China. Equally conversant and knowledgeable on questions of elite politics, as he is with the subnational workings of the Leviathan we call China. This is evident in his widely read publications, which include, but are not limited to, Same Bed, Different Dreams, The Making of Chinese Foreign and Security Policy, The Three Faces of Chinese Power, and Following the Leader. It is equally evident it is more obscure work, such as the criminally out of print policymaking in post Mao China and Paths to Power Elite Mobility in Contemporary China. His latest, co authored with Selena Ho and Cheng Tui Quick, is Rivers of Iron Railroads and Chinese Power in Southeast Asia from the University of California Press. When I was a junior scholar at Washington University in St. Louis, I finally met Mike in person. I was completely disarmed. Nobody with Mike's lists of accomplishments, far too many for me to elucidate here, has any right to be as generous, approachable, and supportive to all who make up the China watching community as Mike is. He is the gold standard of scholarship, policy wisdom, and collegiality. In fact, the only negative thing I've ever heard about Mike was some grumbling because his accumulated frequent flyer miles put him in a category above his jet-setting colleagues. I would argue that Mike belongs in a different category altogether on multiple dimensions. So it is my genuine pleasure to mute myself and to pass the microphone on to my mentor, colleague, and friend, Mike Lampton. Well, Andy, thank you for that. Uh over generous and heartfelt uh, uh, introduction for which I'm most grateful. Uh, the way you set it up, I, I'm going to take the last sentence 
of what I was going to say and put it up front, because I want to be clear that um, I'm optimistic about the future. Uh, we're going to have rough times, ups and downs, all of that. But I would say to younger stars, particularly beginning their career, you know, go into the future with a sense of adventure um, in terms of your research. Uh, the future opportunities and problems will be different, but the good times aren't over. You can always find interesting subjects, information, people, and documents uh, as long as you ask meaningful questions. So I don't think the question should be in the back of our minds, can we do meaningful research in China anymore? It's what kind of meaningful research about China, from what perspective, what angles of view, and there's no, obviously no uh, um, a correct answer to all of this. But I, I, I do think that, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, somebody like me that, built a career substantially on access to China, of course, feels a certain nostalgia when I haven't been there in two and a half years. And quite frankly, there's not the prospect. And certainly there's a certain nostalgia when my wife and I, our first trip to Asia was to Hong Kong. And uh, the, the circumstance we find in Hong Kong is not what many of us would hope in a a personal sense or in fact as a research site sense. So I'm not burying my head in the sand, but so much of life and research is attitude. And I think we ought to all have a really optimistic attitude about the meaningful subjects that are there for us to explore. I just want to say one other thing is, of course, I, uh, I departed SICE as a full-time teacher in 2018. Uh, at that time, I was working on the last book that uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, uh, Rivers of Iron, about uh, building a high-speed rail system from southern China through seven uh, Southeast Asian states, uh, and then another one, including Indonesia, comes into the story. So I went out to Stanford and I uh, was there until early 2020 when the book came out. And now I'm back, proud to say, at the uh, SICE Foreign Policy uh, Institute. And I just want to say to the SICE students that I always loved teaching at SICE. And it was because of the students and my colleagues, but frankly, the students as much. And it was because there was a desire to make the world a better place and but be effective it's not enough to have good intentions outcomes matter and it seemed to me that SAI students had that predisposition to try to make things better but also be effective in the process so i just couldn't be more pleased to be here uh, today um <clears throat> just to say a, a bit more about that uh that, that book, it took us to ultimately nine different countries in Asia, uh, eight of which were in Southeast Asia, but of course, China. And there was a certain amount of luck in that project because we, at least, we decided to interview in China, which meant in, first in 2015 and 2016. China is not nearly as open today nor was it nearly as open when we finished this project. So had I just inadvertently start, ended the project with interviews in China, uh, we probably would have had a little bit different uh, outcome with respect to how China looked in the project or what we could say about it. So the research always has luck, but there's always a fun to, and research has got to be fun. I, I just think that's an important aspect you do. You put your effort into things that you think uh, are fun. And I also just want to make clear that I worked with two SICE former PhD students, one, both of which are now professors in Southeast Asia, one at the Lee Guan Yew School and one at the University of Malaya. And this project could not have been done without them. It was fully equal project. And our, uh, the uh, attribution and on the, the cover of the book indicates it, and it is true. But there's a great advantage, particularly if you're going to do a, a study that crosses boundaries, to have people on your team that represent either different functional skills, geographic skills, linguistic skills, 
So I think one of the takeaways I would say is I think we're headed towards more team research. We're headed towards more comparative research. There can be comparison of pieces of China with other pieces of China, China's behavior in various areas compared to other countries. Uh, so there's all, there are all ways, different ways to have comparison, but I think we're going to comparison and multi teams. And I must say that in a way, that's where I began my career in the 60s, 1960s. If you go back and look, it was marked by some of the great comparative big data studies on the one hand, comparative case studies and so on. So I think I would recommend to students thinking about how to deal with this, go back to the 1960s and look at some of the classic studies by Alexander George, uh, Gabriel Allman, Sidney Verba, Lucian Pai. Uh, there's just a great literature. I'm not trying to refer back to, you know, my youth and uh, inflict it again on the intellectual community. But I think that was a, a very um, uh, a fer uh, fertile period intellectually. Now, uh, I want to say that the, the topic that I was given essentially is how to think about uh, research in the new era or the current situation. And it, uh, it seemed to me I couldn't talk about the research, you know, how to adapt, unless I talked a little about what is the new situation? Uh, what is the current era? And how is it different from what the last 40 years? And I would just concede all the optimism that I expressed at the beginning. This is a very difficult and, um, uh, well, complicated time, but difficult time for uh, just to carry on as business as usual uh, in uh, sort of the research methodologies uh, we developed. Um, but I think this new circumstance has several uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, and uh, they'll be familiar to you, but I do think they are daunting. And it's not, it's a period that's not unfamiliar to me. Because when I went into the China field in 1968-69, my passport prohibited travel to China. Uh, and the assumption was I was learning a skill, set of skills that it would allow me to penetrate to a, at least a deeper level of reality about China to which I would in all probability never go. So the baseline from which I started is we're not going to China here. So how are we going to try to find out about that? Uh, and so maybe that accounts a little for my comfort level, albeit it's much more difficult now. Uh, there are still great possibilities and great careers and great contributions to be made. But this new era uh, is, I think, has a lot of uh, dimensions to it. When I left SAIS, we had Trump as president, uh, and quite frankly, there was no Chinese foreign policy pro There was no foreign policy process. Now, uh, there were foreign policy decisions, and they were done and undone, but there wasn't a regular bureaucratic, expert, database-driven, fact-driven process that could be described. Also, when I uh, left uh, just it was shortly after the 19th Party Congress, and suddenly Xi Jinping was changing the direction of Chinese foreign policy and domestic policy. So much of our access and so much of our own foreign policy was built on the assumption that China... I have you back. Thanks. I'm sorry. We had a power outage here, and uh, it took me a while to get an alternative here. But in any case, uh, when I left and, and this on the whole topic of this new era, and, and China was closing off archives, uh, the foreign ministry archives, um, uh, other archives in China. Uh, NGO law had just been passed and adopted and implemented in 2017. Uh, and the US is throwing up, we'll call it for our purposes today, certain rod, roadblocks for scholarly uh, uh, Americans participating uh, in research uh, in China, and more particularly for Chinese scholars and students here from time to time. So it's not just China making it more difficult. Uh, the Trump administration ended the 
a Fulbright program in China for uh, all intents and purposes. And unless it's happened uh, recently, it hasn't uh, uh, been uh, restored yet. Uh, also, uh, of course, we have uh, Hong Kong, in effect, shutting down as a, uh, a site of the kind of research possibilities that existed uh, before. So, um, in any case, the, the situation is much different. Also, uh, so uh, also we've got the NSF and government funding agencies, NIH, if you're in medicine. Uh, have been raising questions about who's taking money for funded research, uh, who's getting scholarships from the Chinese, and what influence that might have within the United States. And of course, also, you know, what COVID, what hadn't already been damaged is access and mutual exchange, of course. COVID has pretty well shut down the personal uh, interaction between our two peoples and certainly field research. So as I said, I haven't been to China since uh, uh, the start of 2020. And quite frankly, I don't know when uh, that situation will change. I would guess not until at least the 20th Party Congress is over. So you say, well, what's been uh, the result of, of all of this? And I, and I would say also, just by way, there hasn't been that much of a change improvement, if you want to put it that way, in policy with the Biden administration. I think it's an interesting set of topics why there's been so much continuity to two administrations that on many other grounds, you would say, are entirely uh, different. So in any case, uh, what we have is each side is amplifying the negative behavior of the other. And this is not having uh, positive results, not only for uh, scholars and research access and so on, but I would say uh, it's an irony. We're now in the month of the 50th anniversary of Nixon's trip. And if you asked what that was all about, it was about getting space to develop the US-China relationship by recognizing our common interests in limiting and uh, uh, in a sense, incapacitating in a sense, uh, the Soviet Union. And the trend in relations on this 50th anniversary now is in effect, we're becoming more strategically antagonistic. We see China not even willing to um, uh, come out, let us say, uh, uh, with its misgivings, if it has any, about the Ukraine uh, crisis that's ongoing at the moment. And it wasn't very long ago, in 2008, China opposed Russia doing a similar set of pressures and military attempts at dismemberment in Georgia. So what I would say is that uh, the geostrategic situation has deteriorated further. I don't know with Ukraine how much further it's going to go. But the important thing is that when security goes south, then both sides begin to uh, uh, place limits on other aspects of the relationship, either economic, uh, uh, cultural, educational, and so forth. So we cannot expect an improved cultural and economic circumstance, I think, unless we improve the strategic relationship. And you just have to ask yourself, how likely do we think that is? And if you look at Congress, uh, I would say I, I, I came of age as a, a very young man in the, at, when Sputnik was lodged in 1957. And that galvanized a whole generation of, of students to go into engineering and fields seen as germane to the competition with the Soviet Union. And now we are, I, I think, framing the relationship with China and them with us as a competition. And therefore, rather than reassurance and cooperation towards a common set of win-win uh, objectives, uh, every uh, move, whether it's economic, cultural, or military, is made with a, a view to who gets the advantage in each and every step of the competition. 
And right now we have an avalanche of, of uh, legislation moving through Congress. One is the competitiveness uh, or two competitiveness acts. Each One of each is going through the House and the Senate. But the point is we're framing so many things, whether it's domestic infrastructure, R&D uh, uh, funding, uh, towards what's going to give us competitive advantage with respect to China. So uh, I think what we're looking at, this new era, I don't see the bottom. Now, I hope I'm wrong. I hope some other Duas and Machina uh, descends into the equation. But I think we have to develop our research strategies and capabilities with the assumption that field access of any significance and duration in China, or for that matter, Hong Kong, is going to be very much more limited than what we've seen in the past. So I think that's the, the new era as I see it. You can calibrate your own, what you're going to do in light of this by how accurate or inaccurate you think my definition uh, is. But the point is that I think the basic formula is you can't really expect an improvement in the situation if we're each defining the other as their principal strategic uh, adversary. Now, this gets to the next thing that I, I really wanted to say. And that is the job of scholars or teachers isn't just research, although Hopkins was the world's first, or at least America's first real research university, uh, and research uh, and learning through doing and experimentation uh, important. Uh, but uh, the, uh, we need to ask some basic, I think, questions. We have to be questioners. We have to try to educate the public as we educate ourselves. And quite frankly, I think it's very difficult now in the United States, not to mention China. I think Chinese scholars really can't explore reality fully given the constraints they're under. But I think we can and it's our obligation to do so. And I'd be asking some hard questions. Historically, it's been the policy of the United States to uh, try to create a situation or perpetuate a situation where the landmass of Eurasia, that is the space of China and Russia, and J some of the big uh, offshore and, uh, pen and Korean Peninsula, to make sure that that landmass is not under the sway of either a single hostile power to the U.S., or indeed a coalition of hostile powers. And that's why Nixon went to China to essentially divide that Russia-Beijing uh, uh, connection that had existed since the Friendship Treaty in the early 50s. Uh, but what we see now is our, I'm not blaming the US, but I'm saying we are both contributing to a situation that is driving China into the arms of Russia. And I think you got to ask, is that a good idea? Now, you're still left with what do you do about that? Uh, you're left with another question that I'll ask in the moment. But we are now operating in a way that is not, in, is not consistent with our historic foreign policy. And I think when you do that, you at least have an obligation to say, is there a better choice? Did we make the right choice? Is this inevitable? And if it is inevitable, then how can we most effectively deal with the new situation? But I am not convinced this is a wise policy driving Russia and China together. And you see less cooperation on Ukraine. You see less cooperation in the World Health Organization. You see uh, a, a lot of cooperation for exercises, uh, China, uh, Russia, uh, not uh, cer certainly they're a little more aligned on Taiwan than they seem that they used to be. But the point is, it's not going in a good direction. A second big question drives from that. Is China our biggest security problem? How many times have you heard the last two administrations say China is our long term security threat implication bigger than Russia in the long term? We can debate about the short term. That's the way I would put it. But it, it seems to me that uh, at least at the, the current time, you could at least point out 
that uh, it's the Russians that, impl you know, got involved in our um, uh, domestic politics in the last election. Yeah, it's the Russians that seem to be hacking uh, uh, beyond stealing intellectual property, which China does. But the more pernicious hacking, it seems, uh, is, is uh, predominantly uh, Russian. Uh, and of course, uh, Russia now has, a, as you could say, a knife pointed at the heart of Europe. So the idea that it's a slam dunk that China's the biggest problem, I'd at least like to see a little examination of that. Uh, certainly, uh, I, I guess I would say the last sort of big question I would have, it seems like there's a big contradiction at the heart of American policy now. And that is the notion, how many times have you heard we can cooperate where we must, and they usually have in mind the idea of climate change, a proliferation on the Korean Peninsula, uh, uh, international health, global economic management. We ought to be cooperating with China. Uh, no, no question there. But how do you cooperate when you're def each defining the other as your principal strategic problem? And the Chinese are not going to cooperate with somebody who defines them as the principal problem. Now, in all candor, the Chinese are defining us as their central security problem. And from their point of view, that's why they're moving towards Russia. So I would just simply say I'm not casting blame. I'm not pretending I have all the answers, but it's our obligation as scholars and researchers to ask big questions. And so while we're talking about research and the new strategy going forward, we're also dealing with an ongoing world that's evolving that we need to ask some uh, questions uh, about. Now, the, the question that now I'm to the real topic of today. So now that's the era, that's the task. These are the problems. Given all of this, how do we begin to think about doing uh, research uh, in China? And I guess we're all a victim of, our, uh, of the own happenstance that got us to think of things the way we did and undertake the projects we did. But I think that um, at least I would say, um, here are some things to think about as you tick off how you're going to choose a, a topic. I would say a very fruitful way is look at China in interaction with something outside of China. That might be multilateral organizations and compare it to the behavior of others in multilateral organizations. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it might be uh, uh, looking at uh, internal politics in China, how it's driving its foreign policy in different areas of the world and how different areas are responding. Because while we might not have access to Chinese in China, we're going to have access to Chinese all over the world and with people who deal with China all over the world. So maybe we're gonna to have to do more interviewing with third parties. I found it very enlightening to talk to people in eight countries in Southeast Asia about how they think of dealing with China and how they think the Chinese operate. So while we're in a sense losing, and it's invaluable, the Chinese take on China, the Chinese take on China is not the only take there is, and the reaction of the rest of the world and what how they analyze it is all important in terms of how they react, and it gives us a source of information we might not otherwise have had. Also, we don't have to always, we, we can have these big strategic questions, but we don't always have to have a big strategic project. That is to say, simple questions on rather mundane things can produce very significant answers. And so, for example, that's why I picked high-speed rail with the idea that China is trying to connect itself to eight, seven other Southeast Asian countries. Well, how is it trying to do that? Why is it trying to do that? 
What is the reaction of different societies? Why do some Southeast Asian countries differ in their reaction uh, to China? The Vietnamese react rather differently. The Thais yet differently. The Malaysians yet differently. I've got to say, I have a much more, I don't mean totally accurate, I don't mean uh, complete by any means, but I have a much, I have a different view of China by looking through the eyes of other people. So I would say that. And pick a topic, you don't always have to pick a topic that sets off alarm bells. You know, uh, the high speed rail, China's really proud of it. And quite frankly, it should be proud of it. It built something, both a domestic system, a domestic industry, and an export industry in 13 years from the ground up. How did they do it? Do we have anything to learn from that experience? It raised the whole question of, well, okay, the whole world's talking about what balance between market forces and planning and plan and, and more strategic state enterprises. Well, what can we learn from this case, this set of cases about industrial policy? And like it or not, and I'm as dedicated as the last person, last dog dies, I'm a free market kind of person. But at some point you have to say that, that planning can work under certain circumstances. I mean, NASA was planning just in our own set. So uh, this, you, you can look at a topic that's of global significance uh, the, where China's playing a major role, but not only, only role, not only uh, experience uh, in, and so forth. And also, it may sound strange and, uh, to say, but pick a topic you really like, that you're really invested in. You can't wait to get up in the morning. And I've always loved factory visits. Go see how people make things. What do most people do with their life? What are the things that they uh, care about? And, you know, the title of the book, Rivers of Iron, came from talking to a planner in Laos. And I, I said, you know, you've got 7 million people. You're taking on all this debt. Why are you doing this? It was sort of the debt trap question with a smile on my face. And he said, well, you know, Professor Lampton, how did most countries in the world modernize? They were either on the ocean or on very navigable long rivers. And that was, those were the arteries of uh, commerce and exchange of knowledge and information. We're the only landlocked country in Southeast Asia. We have the Mekong River, but we're too far up. It really isn't very navigable and it goes through hostile countries. And, uh, so Mekong looks big on a map, but doesn't do the problem. We have to build our iron rivers. We have to build the infrastructure that God gave others in the form of rivers or location on oceans. And he said, we had a choice. You Americans weren't offering us money to do this. The Japanese didn't think it was a real great financial idea either. But the Chinese came along and offered us. And our choice was go with the Chinese and negotiate the best deal you can or stay poor. Well, you know, we need to think about what are the positions that other people are in dealing with the Chinese? And what are the Chinese really offering them? So long and the short of it is, I think we need sort of more comparative research. They don't have to be incendiary, gotcha kind of research projects. You know, the Chinese love to talk about the high-speed rail projects, and, and they often talk about all the problems they've got. And they talk about, well, we might get expropriated. We have workers in places like Pakistan that aren't safe. Do we send the arm uh, or, or let's say military forces to protect them? If we send military forces, what will you, the Americans, think about that? So all I'm saying is I think broaden out what you're looking at, uh, maybe take it down to temperature in terms of sensitivity, 
and you'll find you get more information. And the other uh, thing I would just say is don't use the word politics too much. Just talk about, well, what are the problems? How did you resolve them? Are they resolved or do you have to try something else? And, and compare China to elsewhere. You know, lots of countries have built railroads and high-speed railroads. And so I have a comparative sense of building infrastructure anywhere in the world is difficult. I grew up in California, Transcontinental Railroad, big deal with me, much of our book, or little of our book, talks about the comparative experience of that. China itself built a railroad in the 60s, the Tanzam Rail in, in Africa, and had uh, lots of lessons. In fact, a SICE professor, Peter Botelier, uh, was a consultant on the Tanzam Railway, if I remember correctly. So. The long and the short of it is, I think there are exciting things to do, even in this dismal uh, bilateral uh, relationship. But be opportunistic uh, is what I would say. Now, the other thing I would say about this research is start with simple questions. You know, I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a little anecdote because all of us at the beginning of our careers have big problems. And I, I uh, had my pros prospectus for my dissertation. It was all full of theory. I had graphs and charts and, and arrows feeding into boxes, into circles, and I really had a theory. And I went and presented it. I got asked the first time I'd ever made a real academic presentation at the University of Hong Kong. And a professor Harris, well, I won't tell you what he said in his comment, but it was, he, he wasn't real impressed with the theory and thought I would basically have to start over again. Now, the other part of listening device is knowing when to take it and when not to take it. Actually, I had a pretty terrific idea on a topic, but he was right. I was heavy on the theory and low on the empirical facts of the situation. So uh, we all have our challenges, but don't let people discourage you too early. But don't start out with a simple question and just take the example of the railroads. Our simple question was, can China do it? This is a, a railroad system that embodies eight countries potentially when it's built. Can China do it? Well, what does do it mean? I didn't mean technologically, although uh, Southeast Asia has a lot of technological challenge, even for the Chinese, because of the mountains and the bridges, just for example, 70% of the mileage in, in Laos is bridges and tunnels. I mean, it's 30% it's on the land directly. So uh, what I meant was politically, can China do it politically? Can it deal with the Vietnamese with which it's had a very rough history? Can it deal with the Laotians because they're so poor? Can they deal with the Thais because they're so aloof? Can they deal with the Singaporeans because Singapore doesn't want to be too strategically dependent on China particularly? So each of these countries uh, represented a pro. Uh, a challenge to the Chinese, which they historically hadn't necessarily been very good at dealing with. And now they have to build a system that integrates and works with each other. I mean, the train has to go through all these countries, which means you have to agree on common standards, common building codes and all of that, equipment symmetry and so forth. So I thought this kind of connectivity interdependence see China in interaction with others. Uh, and don't go in with too many preconceptions other than, you know, China's likely to have many of the same problems anybody else engaging in similar activity. And I think that's a good corrective to the total, um, uh, this sort of breaking the world into authoritarian and democratic doesn't get you to a very good methodological place. 
it's sometimes useful to say in many important things like medicine, building nuclear power plants, railroads, providing health care, pharmaceutical quality. China's probably got mostly the same problems that many other people either have today or did have before they were able to deal with them. So long and the short of it is, I would say go forth with optimism and excitement. Uh, find a, you know, just a topic that really interests you, that has some universality to it. Uh, it helps if there's a big comparative literature and there's uh, infrastructure, just Robert Carroll built New York City, Selznick, the TVA. There is a wonderful literature, but the point is on many topics, there's a literature about how other people have done it. What problems did they find? And we've got to get away from this idea of China is China is China, and it's authoritarian, authoritarian, authoritarian. It is authoritarian, but I don't think that gets you too far when you try to probe, that, well, how does society work day to day on most issues of most concern to most people most of the time? So Andy, I don't know how long I went without all these uh, the interruptions, but I'm, I'd, I'd love to have some questions. So thanks, thanks so much, Mike. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Just want to test the, uh, the, the IT on my end. So this was really, really terrific. And there's just so much to unpack. And uh, you know, we do have time for questions and we already have a, a, a queue of questions lined up, but I just wanted to kind of take advantage of you know, my, my holding the microphone here, or one of them anyway, um, just to ask a couple questions that, um, uh, that, that I, you know, that, that, that resonated from your talk, but also um, uh, provided a kind of connection with uh, kind of scholarship when, you know, before the kind of the, the, the current bad old days. Um, so, you know, your work um, and, you know, the work of, you know, people who I, I mentioned before, Ken and Mike, you know, on, uh, on, um, you know, on healthcare or on energy, you know, back in the 1980s. I mean, one of the things that was really innovative about it was that by looking at various cases, whether they were a bureaucracy or whether they were a particular project like the Three Gorges or what have you, they really allowed us to look at the inner workings of the state. So the various ways in which discrete actors uh, worked with one another in ways that would not, um, th that, that did not conform to our priors or official or even unofficial organizational charts and what have you. Um, would it be right to think, in your opinion, that uh, we're actually presented with a similar opportunity to really look at the kind of the workings of the Chinese state, but just on a different canvas? Right. Well, I think that's a, a great observation, and um, I'll have a little free association because it's such an evocative question. But you may remember uh, Gabriel Allman and Lucian Pai. There was the whole what was called uh, political culture, explaining Chinese behavior by the at politically relevant attitudes that the society had as widely shared attitudes. And I've always thought, and I found this when I lived for six months in Wuhan studying management and planning in the Yangtze River, and I was housed in effect uh, for functional purposes, I was given the, uh, the Dweko Donway, so to speak, or Jedi Donway, uh, was the Yangtze River Valley Planning Authority under the Ministry of Water Conservancy. My residential boss was the Ministry of Education, but my functional boss was the Ministry of Water Conservancy. And I noticed very early on the Ministry of Water Conservancy was always fighting with the Ministry of Electric Power. And I say also in interviewing, be naive. Say, I'm sure there's a simple answer that uh, me as a, you know, rough hewn foreigner can't quite understand, but can you explain to me, why does everybody in the Ministry of Water Conservancy seem to be unhappy with the Ministry of Electric Power? And, you, and then after you got a little confidence, you'd say, and I noticed 
Sometimes the Ministry of Electric Power is put into the Ministry of Water Conservancy, and sometimes they're divorced. So why do we have this merger and so on? Well, I, I'll never forget one talk. It, and, and if you act, it, if your Chinese isn't too good, then they try to be real clear. And that's actually a plus. And he said, well, Professor Lampton, the Ministry of Water Conservancy in its spirit, its jingsheng, its taidu, its attitude, is about protecting the peasants from flood and making sure they have water for their rice. That's our constituency. That's our mission. Who's the electric powers? They're about cities. They're about industry. They're about workers. And incidentally, they earn a lot of revenue from every kilowatt they generate. And we don't earn much. Water is low priced in China. <laughs> and that's a whole environmental problem. So I said, well, tell me more about this, this culture of the ministry. And, you know, people spend their lives working in an institution like we did at SICE or, or do you do at SICE or whatever. And we define a big part of our meaning in terms of our task. And the Chinese are no different than anybody else. And they prefer to be spending their life doing something they think worthwhile than not worthwhile. So I think this whole area of trying to understand the psychology of the units people work in is really fruitful. Now, it works be that topic works better if you have access to Chinese. You'll remember Richard Solomon tried to talk about the political culture of communist China by interviewing Taiwanese. Well, we, we did the best we could and we didn't, you know, that, that, that was insightful. But there was always something a little off about asking Taiwanese to explain China's political culture, right? So not, but, but the point is that I think it's a more fun, uh, for many topics, it's a more fruitful place to begin is China's like other places, rather than China is China is China to only be understood in its own terms. And, you know, that applies to interest groups, theory and bureaucratic politics, as you mentioned. So let me just follow up because there's um, there are two things in, in, in your response that really resonated with me just in terms of my own experience when I was starting out and I was really nervous about everything, whether or not I was doing things right or what was the right way of doing it and how come I, I was having so much trouble, you know, finding it, at least in my, you know, in my mind's eye. One is, you know, particularly people in our discipline, you know, we're obsessed about the why question. Um, and, you know, I found when I would ask uh, uh, interlocutors in China the why question, I would get just just a cacophony of possible, you know, explanations. But mm -hmm. it was, you know, I saw that as our job. Um, and in fact, what I what I saw in what I thought was much more useful, and I think you touched upon this, you just articulated it differently, is that the what question is really important. Like, what's mm -hmm. going on? What is, you know, it, it's, uh, what are you doing? What, you know, how does, you know, essentially have to work with, uh, with your interlocutors to problem solve in terms of understanding how something functions. So, mm -hmm. and that's another way of avoiding these, uh, you know, these types of gotcha questions. Right. Well, um, I'm working on a book that deals in part with, with this whole question, but I go back and, and it gets to ask questions to get information and do so with a kind of, um, you've, you've got to look credible and serious on the one hand, but not threatening on the other. And so I, I, my very first interview on healthcare, which I, ultimately um, lived in Hong Kong to, with refugees as my principal source. My very first interview was with a woman who had worked for the Ministry of Health and fled to Falls Church, Virginia. And I was out at, in California and my PhD 
advisor knew her and I flew back and I talked to her and I started to ask her questions. And she said, first thing first, the Ministry of Public Health. How does how's it organized? And she pulled out a piece of paper and drew an organization chart. And uh, that was the single most valuable piece of advice I ever got. Get a map of what the world looks like to the people you're talking to organizationally. And what became, and ministries like other, like state enterprises, like provinces, they all have contradictions, conflicts of interest, things that need to be resolved. So, uh, you know, in the case of, um, let's take pharmaceuticals. You have a pharmaceutical product, but the a Ministry of Industry, Chemistry, or whatever, is making it, but the consumer of it is the Ministry of Public Health. So I've got all these refugees that are telling me they prefer foreign medicines because domestic-made medicines in China make them shake. That is, have side effects. They didn't trust them. So I asked, well, why doesn't the Minister of Public Health, um, you know, issue an edict? Well, it's because he, at that time it was a he, had no, um, no channel of authoritative command. The Minister of Public Health has to go up to, through, uh, depending on what the topic is, but basically up through vice premiers, premiers, Politburo, depending on the decision, and that top has to then order the other shitung, the chemical industry, to begin, and that has to go down. So you have this problem of, of not authoritative command across the system, no law and courts with which to resolve it in a more expeditious way. So people develop a preference for finding other ways to resolve conflicts, because not many get up the, the system given the scale of the system. So the point is, if you just look carefully at an organization chart and begin to ask questions about who has what problems with who and why, and probably don't use the word problems too much to say, I noticed you, you mentioned uh, there was some difficulty over here in the, why didn't your minister just go over and have a have tea and take care of the problem. So, but the but the point is, this is all understandable in terms of bureaucratic behavior. There are some Chinese wrinkles and different institutions, and there's no law, particularly there's administrative fiat, but no law. So I'm not saying everything's the same in China, but you can get to the right questions by assuming there is a lot that is similar. So I don't know. Did that hit your question, Andy? It did. That's a great. Uh, that's a great. Um, uh, uh, yeah. No. It's a, it's it's a great way to 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 get at that. Um, let, I'm just gonna. We have so many questions that uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to ask one last very quick one, um, and then start um, uh, uh, bringing in some of the questions from from our audience, which are mostly we've been talking. You know, maybe at thirty thousand feet, or uh, you know, down to maybe um, you know the uh, uh, little bit beneath the Gulf Stream. But uh, some of these are really, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, very much in the weeds. But let me ask one kind of in the weeds question that might help, you know, uh, segue into that. And that is, you, you know, you made the point, uh, and I think it's a really important one, of being able to talk to other interlocutors who are not Chinese in these third party situations, contexts, countries, what have you, uh, about you know, their interactions with, you know, with their Chinese interlocutors. What about with expat Chinese in those, you know, in those areas? What was your experience? Did you have access to them? Did, you know, was, were, was, what is, was what they were able to provide satisfying or um, to what you were trying to do? Well, uh, everybody's experience is its own sui generis thing. So when you talk about me interviewing Chinese in a third location, is I think what you were hypothesizing. 
when I went to Hong Kong, the Chinese in a third location were refugees from China. And, and it was a British colony. And as long as we're going to get in the weeds, and I think that's really valuable because it's research is a very human experience. The Chinese were afraid of two, th the, the Chinese I talked to were afraid of at least probably three things, the secret police. <laughs> and many came from Guangdong and you were never quite sure who was really PRC and who wasn't and, and so on. So they were worried about that. But more to the point, they were worried about the British because if they stepped out of line or caused trouble with the Communist Party, which meant the party committee in Guangdong for most purposes, the party committee in Guangdong would, I don't know, ring up or otherwise notify the British and the British were not gonna jeopardize their situation in Hong Kong for let's say unruly guests in the colony. So they were always worried about that. And then of course they had family in many cases back in China. So you really had to, you, when you talk to these people, it, it was almost a secret underground passing refugee contacts and it was all built on faith. And I inherited, I would say the Mike Oxenberg and uh, Ezra Vogel network. And research was really Chinese in the sense of Guanxi. Now, that was the best we could do. I, I mentioned Solomon trying to figure out political culture in China from Taiwan. That was one channel. But figuring out how China worked from refugees who were very unhappy and had all sorts of un incentives to badmouth, maybe, or people, when you ask them a question, oh, particularly, don't pay for interviews. Because if you pay for interviews, you pay for people to keep talking. <laughs> and, and if they don't know, they're going to sound like they know, because it's now become a job for them. So in any case, I would say uh, you, the, the mere fact that you were interviewing refugees meant you were dealing with a subset of Chinese. And the fact was, that most Chinese didn't leave China. Now, many of those most Chinese didn't leave China because they couldn't. They were too far. It was too risky. They got killed on the way out, and many did. Uh, so uh, lots of reasons. Uh, so you're facing, you're, you're trying to find out the general situation from a non-general population. It's not very good survey technology <laughs> that we're talking about here, but you do the best you can. And all I would say is uh, maybe uh, there ought to be a course, uh, well, that at least has a section on what did people that interviewed refugees in the 1960s, uh, how accurate when we got more access to China, does their research look in retrospect? And I haven't done a survey, but I don't mean it was perfect, but it was pretty good, yeah. I think. So uh, that different people have a different assessment. So I, I would say, let the questions drive, pick the interesting questions, Try to be as methodologically sound as conditions permit. But as my advisor said, don't let, you know, methodology stand in the way of a good question. That's, I think that's all advice that we can, uh, we can definitely learn from, live with, and, uh, and, uh, um, and, and, and follow. Mm -hmm. So let me, let me uh, get to some of the questions that, um, uh, uh, that uh, some of the um, uh, audience members have asked, have been asking. So, um, so uh, one person asks, you've done a lot of interviewing in, in your various, uh, in your uh, uh, latest book and, and, and previous work on, on, on government and bargaining. Uh, this person is doing research on local bureaucracy as well, and, uh, and it requires interviewing local officials. Um, what, uh, this person asks, what, do you think I can do to make projects like this possible? 
Uh, I'm using social media for interviews, but it's certainly not working as well as I want. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, first of all, I've never had to quite deal with that in such an adverse environment, something that presumes so much access at a lower level of society. So I think that is a, a tough problem. And I, I don't, well, I mean, I'll be just frank, I don't know exactly how I do it. But I guess what I would think about is, it, you obviously want it to do this, have to go to China, uh, at least, and, and I would say, find a locality or several localities that are for whatever set of reasons interesting to you, or, or make a compare, fill out the boxes in a comparative matrix and get a few places and go there over time and keep going back until you're a kind of known commodity. Now, right now, that, that seems not possible at all. But my, my inclination would be to try to find an area. To, and at this point, you know, Hong Kong's going to present all sorts of interesting cases. Now, I'm not, I think it's risky. I would actually, I'm, I don't, I, I can't understand my own feeling, but I'm a little more nervous about going to Hong Kong than I am China, just per se. But I do think over the long run, you know, doing local studies in little different subsets of Hong Kong local communities might be very interesting and not on politically charged issues, you know, might be on provision of water or education or well, everything can be controversial. But I would think about Hong Kong. Also, Taiwan is a really interesting place. And of course, when we couldn't get to China, many of my generation did studies of all sorts in Taiwan. And you also have many Taiwanese who also have residents in the mainland. And here's a good idea. I went to Jin Mun. Jin Mun is technically part of the ROC, but really part of the PRC. And it's a fast, people come over on the ferry, professors from, uh, you know, uh, Fujian uh, University or Shaman University come over, teach half the day, go back and teach at their home university. Students from the uh, Jin Mun sometimes go to school in the PRC. You have split families. So I'm saying I would look for those peripheral areas as close to China and find those, that would be one strategy. Uh, now, I mean, I, I read Ding Xian and all the great rural studies of, of, of China and how great those were when what I just proposed isn't that. I would love to do that, but I realize that that's going to be a little hard right now. I think many local people would be a little nervous having a, an American, uh, at least, uh, asking too many questions. It, it, it'd be interesting, and my instinct says that uh, uh, SAIS students who are not Americans may have more opportunities, <laughs> and, and we'll see how that goes. But uh, I don't know. That was only that was a B minus answer at best, Andy. Uh, I only for grading on a weird curve. Uh, I, I think it was really um, uh, helpful because it's a really difficult question. Um, and uh, you know, I think some of the other questions I can bundle them together. Maybe look at the kind of the flip side of that, which uh, is something that uh, may be a little bit more. Uh, familiar to all of us, and that is kind of concern over our, you know, protecting our Chinese interlocutors, um, you know, uh, and, you know, what are, you know, there, there are a number of, I mean, there's a debate, but there's also a fairly definitive China quarterly article about kind of what, um, you know, how uh, the China scholarly community comes out on all that, and it, it's, it's something that uh, I think the, the, the takeaway from that, or one of the takeaways, is that that's probably the most important <laughs> concern that China scholars have, is protecting uh, the people that, uh, that they interact with in China. Uh, but is this, do you see this as being a difference in, and, and it, there's no way anybody could possibly know the answer, but do, 
do you see the current situation as a difference in degree or a different in kind, just in terms of being able to, just in terms of managing our expectations about what had been a, a you know, a very productive source of data for us? Well, looking back on it, I, you know, I'm of the generation where we pushed mechanical buttons, not electronic, right? So I'm not sure I understand all of the capabilities and vulnerabilities. So I'm not the most informed person to answer that question. But I've been worried, uh, you know, uh, all my interviews <clears throat> have been put into what I, at the time when I developed it, what I thought was a very secure system. But what was secure and you don't want to change your system each week because everything you did for the last 40 years was coded by some other arrangement or is in some other system. So changing and updating all your data, so to speak, to be in an ever more protected form, at least I don't know how to do that. Now, you know, and, and I probably should. But I am worried about the vulnerability of old data gathered in the new circumstance. And I've tried to do what I can to protect it. But, but related, I, there were a couple of points related, but I, I just spit them out. And then if I'll get back to your question directly. There's a related question, and that is when, when you do have an interesting data set and you want to make it available to others, like in archives. And that is a really difficult set of questions because now you have to sort of set some standards. Now, I just dedicated all or uh, donated all of my interviews to the Rockefeller Archive Center because they've been so involved in China and they have enough money to protect, protect, it, protect it all. Uh, and uh, but you still have to decide when is a long enough time after you're dead to have others look at it. And of course, my impulse is let everybody look at it today. I mean, that, that would be my preference. But on the other hand, all those people and who are mentioned or sources or just in glancing got mentioned, I'm not quite sure what all the lie, you know, what what all the interests that could be affected there. So that tends to push you out to a longer kind of thing. The other thing is we're getting more of a hostile relationship. And I think this is an important thing for people to think about. What relationship, if any, do you want with the intelligence communities? And that doesn't just necessarily mean American. It can mean Canadian, European, whatever. Uh, and by uh, relationship, I mean, uh, will you go and brief them? Will you uh, take funding for a big comparative project? Unless I'm try trying to sound purist, early on I in my career was presented with this. And I took a contract with CIA, but I negotiated the terms that it would be open, the funding would be acknowledged, and all of the research that I gathered, um, and there was a, a little but, uh, which I will get to, but, but basically it was my book, Pass to Power, about leadership mobility in China. And the CIA was interested in who was the new leaders after Mao? Where did they come from? Who were they? And they funded a research project that took me over much of the world to archives and talking to, at this point, Guomindang and, and other uh, intelligence services. It was a wonderful project, but I didn't want it to die in some dark room of the CIA. Also, at the time I went through at that time, it was very controversial. What relationship should you even have with American intelligence, because they're premised on closure and academics is on openness. There was the Vietnam War, there were all sorts of questions about CIA behavior. 
And so I'm not saying I had the right answer, but I've had an, I had an answer that I am comfortable with to this day. And that is as long as you acknowledge where you got the money and what you found out, then that, that was the threshold I found adequate. So I would say uh, that's a whole nother set of issues to think about and, and, and maybe government funding in general. And just one last thing on that. I think people have to be aware, I was aware, I won't mention the institutions, but the Chinese were offering sm really fairly small fellowships for language study in China. But it became clear to me, or at least it was clear enough to me, whether I was right or wrong, that taking money from China when you were filling out security clearances as a young student applying for a job in the government, and they get to the question, have you taken money from China? <laughs> and you got to check the box, yes, you might not want to check it. I mean, that might not be your what you thought was the best. So I, I think you've got to be very quite careful about where you take money from, who you will work with, under what conditions. And it turns out I hit CIA just at a moment when they were in maximum openness under Stansfield Turner. You know, 50 other CIA directors would never have agreed to what they agreed to with me. So you, you just have to set these rules and feel comfortable with them. Uh, and in the end, when in doubt, protect your sources. It's interesting how a lot of the problems or a lot of the challenges um, that uh, uh, existed, you know, in earlier, you know, earlier eras of studying China are, you know, not all that dissimilar. Uh, right. With, uh, you know, what, what we're dealing with now. Uh, there, uh, one person has a question on, um, I'm just going to read the question. Uh, it's a terrific question. One of the approaches I have found quite instructive working on the ground throughout China over the years and trying to better understand how and why certain decisions were or are being made about economic reform was to engage in dialogue with my Chinese counterparts, asking them, which countries do they look to in understanding how to best deal with the issues inside? That really helped in improving the dialogue. Is that yeah. an approach? And the question is, is that an approach that you believe is useful? Well, I've got to say just the, the fact that the person that just asked that question got me thinking in my mind, that's a really wise observation lying behind that. And I wish I had taken more of the advice implicit. I mean, the fact of the matter is us Americans love to hear ourselves talk. <laughs> uh, the broad sweeping generalization. But there's an implicit flat, and I don't mean flattery in a false sense, there's an implicit respect when you ask somebody else how they look at the world, why, or what have they learned from their experience? And so I think, yes, trying to establish a human relationship of equality, intellectually, informationally, is critical. If people don't like you, they're not gonna talk to you, or at least it's not gonna be as productive and reliable. And uh, I would just say apropos of this too. So yes, asking their opinion. But sometimes you also, somebody confides in you that something is really, it's important and it has implications for them, but they've put their trust in you. And I think never breaking trust. Now, we all get put in situations that either we inadvertently do or we didn't know it was sensitive or any number of things. But I'm saying, you know, I remember George Schultz, he, he got the Eisenhower Award and I went to it in New York City. And he, he said, I really only have, you know, about one thing to say here. And that is that trust is the coin of the realm. And a good example of that is when um, SARS hit in China in 2002, late and early 2003, 
Johns Hopkins had the choice of bringing out all of its students and leaving the Chinese to the mercies of the virus. Jump ship. Well, bless Hopkins' heart and Sice's heart. We found a grant, we found a, a sponsor, we moved the whole school to Hawaii, to the East West Center. And that act of both humanity and trust got enormous mileage. And it's just this general point. This is what so bothers me about defining the reality of China as autocracy versus democracy. There, there are 1.4 billion people there. You know, they got all sorts of money. And you know, uh, democracy isn't a, a single end of a continuum and authoritarianism the other. All these systems are mixed. So I think part of doing research is to realize the mixed character. And uh, so, in any case, uh, I, I just think you know, trust above everything. I think that's great advice. Um, I There's another question that actually points back to some of the earlier talks that we had last semester, which um, for those of you attending, if you um, uh, haven't seen them, I would strongly uh, urge you to do so because they're, um, uh, I, I just found them just wonderful uh, to, uh, you know, to an individual. Um, but the question is, what do you see as the role of careful document analysis? That is old school Pekingology, and I'm gonna read it verbatim, a la Alice Miller, as access to Chinese within uh, China weakens. What are some of the best, or what are some of the, or what are the best strategies for learning those techniques beyond just reading a lot? Well, uh, I said, first of all, in our next, our, our next phase of research, we are going to, uh, one avenue is to form multi, um, I said multilateral or multifunctional skills, multi country origin people, uh, but form comparatively diverse research teams. Uh, and so they, you know, take my two colleagues on the uh, Rivers of Iron. Um, when it got to reading Southeast Asian documents and decoding them, they were much more uh, sensitive to what things were really being said and what people really meant than me. So I would say, uh, you know, have a sort of a diverse uh, team. Secondly, I would say, uh, you said the importance of documentary analysis, and I, I think that's true. Uh, and I'll get back to the but the, the point is documentary analysis is also key for interviewing. If you just think about what an airline ticket costs, nights in hotel, if you need interpreters, you think what a day abroad costs, costs you can't be afford, afford to be asking questions, the answer to which have been on every newspaper in the world or in your country or in your town for, You've got to go in with as much public knowledge as possible. And it's, it's not just an economic question. When you start, particularly in, in uh, technical areas like medicine or water conservancy or railroads, there's a vocabulary. You only have to use one or two words and they know what you mean and it's precise. If you don't know that vocabulary, first of all, you're wasting your time and you're not communicating. Uh, but most important is probably in the first five or seven minutes, they decide, are you serious or not? And am I gonna spend much time with you? And the most intimidating interview I ever had was in Hong Kong with a Chinese tycoon. And I walk in and he says, Mr. Lampton, I decide whether I, take you seriously in five minutes, start talking, right? That focuses the mind. Uh, so uh, anyway, documentary analysis, it's important to all research. And I would think one way to make sure, particularly if you can't go to the target system, well, 
you go to part of the target society, but not, not necessarily China for this, that you have a multilateral team. And I found my multilateral team continually it pointed out my, my Chinese blinders. I'm not sure the Chinese would always think I was so <laughs> sympathetic, but people with a different prism and they, they, they got different documents. If you're reading or have a different mental framework or perspective, you look at different things. So I think documentary research is just key. And also, at least documents are there replicable and other people can see them with footnotes. I mean, in the end, I tried to be faithful in my interviews, uh, but I was writing them down and Sometimes people were saying interesting things over dinner and you had a cocktail napkin. Well, this isn't ideal, right? So I would say documents are just get as many as you can and extract as much as you can and get as many eyeballs with different preconceptions on those documents. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I, I, um, you know, one thing that I would add to that is don't assume you're going to, if you have access to something today, that you're going to have access to it next week. And so hoard like crazy. Get way more data than you think you're going to need right. because you never know, um, uh, you know, when you're going to run out of uh, gas or opportunity. Um, and I have uh, a project that I'm going to be working on that are uh, really going to rely heavily on documents that I um, collected in the, in the early aughts. One other observation I'll just make, and uh, hopefully uh, I'm not uh, kind of putting him on the spot, but when I was doing my dissertation research, I was uh, in the same uh, Donway as uh, Scott Kennedy. Uh -huh. And I just remember when he was finishing up, uh, you know, this is what his dissertation, which eventually was his book on, uh, on lobbying. But it was when he was finishing up his interviews on, on software, then he was going to go into his next case, which was steel. And I just remember him sitting at his desk, writing down as many steel related uh, vocabulary as right. possible. And it was, it was really a, I mean, just a, a really systematic uh, a way of doing, I think, what we right. all should be doing. Um, right. If you, you speak in people's language, and not, it's, it's not just Chinese isn't the language necessarily. It's the technical subset of Chinese. Now, you're never going to be an, a total expert, but you can learn the, and you can show interest in that. So I think that's extremely what you described as Scott's uh, methodology good. Uh, let me just say one theme about this documentary thing. There are a lot of lessons here, but I, you, when I started, you did a lot of, you spent a lot of time in libraries. And, and archives. And my first experience was in, in Taiwan. In 1978, there was still martial law. And I, to have, be frank, I had a terrible experience. First of all, I, I was working on the CIA project, was very open about that. It turns out that Jean Kai-shek was as suspicious of the CIA as Mao Zedong, practically. So the idea that was going to be a door opener, the minute I was transparent, I was closing doors. So I've always said that that was a terrible research experience. Fast forward four years, I go to an archive in uh, China at Wuhan University, and I got to know the librarian. At first, the, the policy, which was exactly the same in the ROC, is you couldn't go into the stacks. You have to tell the clerk, and they will go see if it's there. Meaning, do they want you to see it as an internal publication? And it usually took a day between the request and the answer coming back. And you could only ask for one or two volumes. And if they didn't come back, you had just wasted 24 hours waiting for nothing. So supremely uh, um, frustrating. Fast forward to Wuhan University in 82, turns out the librarian there was just a lazy guy. And he didn't want to keep going back in the stacks. And after a few days, he said, Lampton, go, go look at your materials. I don't care. 
uh, and that was the most productive tour in in stacks in China or in a library in China I ever had. So there's there's luck, and it's humans running these documentary systems. So if you can find out how they work, ingratiate yourself with the keepers of the materials. And if you're lucky, you can enlist them with them starting to come and say, I think you might find this of interest. I try to tell uh, my students and younger colleagues that, um, you know, I, I, I reminded of this line in All the President's Men when the reporters go to their editor, Ben Bradley, and they say, we haven't had much luck lately. And Bradley's response is, well, get some. Uh, and, yeah. you know, I, I think that that's... Exactly. If you put yourself in the position where you're going to be able to recognize a lucky break and exploit it, that's... that's uh, exactly. Research has got a lot of luck. Yes. So let me just ask, uh, in the couple minutes we have left, I'm going to ask a, um, kind of a, a question that uh, we could talk about all, all afternoon long, but uh, it, and that is there are many, many stories, so I'm going to read it verbatim. There are so many stories of China researchers who publish critical work abroad and then are targeted by China or banned. Is there any way for individuals to protect our academic freedom uh, uh, on China uh, abroad. So it's, I guess it's kind of the, um, uh, the obverse of, um, you know, the I mean, ideas. how can we publish the truth with, by, while reducing the risk of being punished? Is that the crude version? That would be the crude version of, yeah. Well, I think you, every individual in, in a different, I realize at different life stages, you're more or less risk averse, right? <laughs> Broadly speaking, when you're younger and have many years ahead, you don't want to uh, immolate early on. So I, I understand that. But every person at every stage has to decide what risks and what category. You, you don't always have to say everything that's on your mind. And, and some things you choose to say, you may not say publicly. And I don't think always that's a big moral question. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But we come across these issues where this is really core to your value system. You think for whatever set of reasons you have an obligation to do that. And then I think you have to be real willing to take what the system is probably going to try to shoot your way. Uh, you try to, uh, and I'll, I, I, I just give it to, because it's an example that happened to me. I've, the Chinese have not gone after me, in, as far as I know, ever in the way that the question suggests. So I realized that, it, and there are probably a lot of reasons for that. On the other hand, the Chinese have only published really one of my books. And uh, to me, I would have liked the Ch China to read it. And I don't mean for monetary. I think it's accurate to say that while I've been promised royalties, I'm unaware that I ever received any. So this wasn't a monetary statement, but I would have liked, you know, a big audience in China to read. So I'd get feedback. Now, a couple of my books were printed in pirate editions. And so occasionally Chinese that read them, uh, I got a little feedback. But, um, you know, in one case, I uh, won't get into all the detail, but there was a chapter on Chinese leaders. That's just really sensitive. And, and it might be okay to say nice things about the current leader, but ironically, you can't say nice things necessarily about the preceding leader. So even if you're trying to flatter people, that doesn't work because the current guy's worried about how he looks in comparison to his... So they said, drop this chapter or it's not published. I said, I, I wrote one book, not two books. I'm not driving in that case, the Chinese publisher, and I won't say which one, but it was a major press, said, Professor Lampton, China will never be a great country until it can publish views with which it disagrees. 
Another book, uh, oh, I had one published in Hong Kong because Hong Kong was at that moment more liberal. The next time I went back, Hong Kong wasn't as liberal and that book couldn't be published in Hong Kong, in which case I went to Taiwan. So, uh, you, 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 you can be punished, let's put it this way, in direct ways, in a retaliatory sense, or you can just be punished by being sort of, I don't know, is this the Chinese version of being canceled or whatever, but, but there are lots of ways that the system can make known its unhappiness. Uh, I, know, I don't generally set out to make them, them or anybody really, I don't set out to make unhappy, but you have to be willing to live with it. And uh, my red line's always been, I'm not changing what I write. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you're right about risk aversion and risk acceptance, because I remember when I, before I started uh, really working on my book on, on China's relations with the Khmer Rouge, I remember the chair of my department at the time sat me down and he said, what would you, you know, what would you, I mean, would you be willing if this meant not being, you know, issued a visa again, would you, uh, uh, and I, you know, my response was, it's a book that has to be written. Right. So, yeah, I mean, if a scholar isn't about saying what they think, with due respect for sensitivities and different values and all that, I'm not saying being a bull in a china shop, so to speak. Right. But in the end, you have to have some core values. They don't all have to be the same or among all of us, but <clears throat> there's got to be a there there. Well, Mike, we are past time. Uh, and I do you have any uh, final comments that you want to share uh, with with the audience? Well, I'm just sorry that my power decided to give hiccups early on. I don't know how long I was frantically trying to restore <laughs> things here. It it didn't look frantic on our end. I mean, it was good. just uh, just a minute or two. So so good. we're good on that end. Good. Well, I thank everybody for the uh, questions and you, Andy, for your good leadership and all my colleagues at SICE. Well, Mike, thank you so much for taking the time out. I think uh, you've given us a lot to chew on in the best possible way. So Good. thanks again. Good to be with you. Right back at you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.